Series of Creation, Talk 11. This talk is about the Ruin Six-Day Reconstruction Theory and the advantages and disadvantages of holding this view. This theory is closely linked with the gap theory and they go hand in hand. If a person accepts one, they generally accept the other, as neither is easily reconcilable with any other biblical or scientific scenario. The details of this theory are fairly well summarised by Western Field in Unformed and Unfilled, where he states this. In the far distant, dateless past, God created a perfect heaven and earth. Satan was ruler of the earth, which was peopled by a race of men without any souls. Eventually, Satan, who dwelled in a garden of Eden composed of minerals, Ezekiel 28, rebelled by desiring to come, become like God, Isaiah 14. Because of Satan's fall, sin entered the universe and brought on the earth God's judgment in the form of a flood, indicated by the water of Genesis 1, verse 2. And then a global ice age when the light and heat from the sun was somehow removed. All the plant, animal and human fossils upon the earth today date from this Lucifer's flood and do not bear any genetic relationship with the plants, animals and fossils living upon the earth today. There's some variation to these details depending upon the individual holding the theory but this gives a fairly good general scenario. Some have believed in the theory of successive destructions and reconstructions, each one laying down another geological layer possibly as a result of a series of worldwide floods, the last being Noah's flood. Prior to 1800, many Christians believed that the geological features of the earth were attributable to Noah's flood. But when the successive geological layers were discovered, George Cuvier, 1769 to 1832, proposed that a series of such floods could have caused them. This may have given rise to the alternative theory of there being successive destructions and reconstructions rather than just the one which is proposed by the standard gap theory. Whichever view is preferred, they're all generally agreed that the geological layers along with their fossils were laid down during the gap. Support for the idea of Lucifer's flood has been found by some gap theorists in Genesis 1 verse 2 and 2 Peter 3 verses 5 to 7. Genesis 1 2 says that when the earth had become a ruin and a desolation, darkness was over the face of the deep, showing that as a result of the worldwide catastrophe, the earth was covered with water. The deduction is made that this water is the result of Lucifer's flood. Similarly, in 2 Peter 3 verses 5 to 7, it says, but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same, world, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. From this, it's inferred that the original earth, as described in Genesis 1-1, was destroyed by a worldwide flood, Lucifer's flood, and that the present earth referred to is the one that was refashioned by God in six days. By this interpretation of 2 Peter 3 verses 5 to 7, a dual purpose is fulfilled. Firstly, it supports the gap theory, and secondly, it dispenses with the idea that this refers to the worldwide flood of Noah. Many, though not all, gap theorists reject the idea of Noah's flood being worldwide, as this goes against present-day geology, and present-day geology is precisely what the gap theory wants to harmonise with. These people usually believe that Noah's flood was a local flood in the Mesopotamian floodplain. Some who hold the gap theory in conjunction with the worldwide flood of Noah explain that Noah's flood left little if any evidence of itself, and that it must have left all the geological layers untouched. In other words, it must have been a worldwide tranquil flood. Another point made in support of the ruin construction, reconstruction theory is that as, as God is light, 
then the darkness referred to in Genesis 1-2 cannot characterise the initial state of creation. It must have become so at some sub subsequent point in time as a result of judgment. In support of this, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 is quoted. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Here, an analogy is made between the darkness in the heart due to sin, subsequently illuminated by the entrance of Christ, and the darkness over the surface of the deep as the result of sin, subsequently illuminated by God, saying, let there be light. However, although this interpretation may fit this verse, it's also just as logical to make a different analogy. Here, just as a person is born in darkness, so the world began in darkness. And just as Christ subsequently shone a light into our hearts, so God subsequently shone light on the world. While on the subject of light, it's also pointed out in a note on Genesis 1-3 in the Schofield Reference Bible that the light, of course, came from the sun, but the vapour diffused the light, and later the sun appeared in an unclouded sky on day four. This is, of course, similar to the explanation used by people who hold the day-age theory in order to explain the creation, in inverted commas, of light on day one and, and the sun, moon and stars on day four, when they had already been created in the beginning, Genesis 1.1. In further support of this theory, it's also sometimes pointed out that in Genesis 1.28, the King James Version says, And God blessed them, male and female, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. If the earth had to be replenished, it implies that at one time it had already been stocked. However, it's properly pointed out that the Hebrew word, or the, the Hebrew verb male, translated as replenish, means simply to fill, and it's correctly translated as such in the NIV. So it says there, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. There is no suggestion of a refilling in this verse, and it cannot therefore be used to support the belief that pre-Adamite men existed and are alluded to in the Bible. So what's the advantage of believing the ruin six-day reconstruction theory? Well, the theory allows enough time to elapse during the gap to accommodate modern geological theories. But what are the disadvantages of the theory? Well, firstly, although this theory seeks to harmonise the Bible with modern scientific views on the age of the Earth, it is based on the belief that a worldwide catastrophe took place in the distant past which fact no modern geologist accepts due to the lack of ev any evidence to support it. And secondly, Genesis 1.31 says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. In accordance with the gap theory, everything that God had made, Asa means refashioned, must have included the sedimentary rocks full of the fossilised remains of plants and animals and man-like creatures who had suffered and died as a result of a prior judgment of the world. So first, it seems unlikely that God would have described such a world as very good. And second, it seems unlikely that if he did refashion the earth, he would have left the evidence of his prior creation intact. And thirdly, the worldwide cataclysm prior to Genesis 1 verse 2, on which this theory is based, has to have some plausible explanation. This is given by supposing that Satan's rebellion and fall, described in Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 15 and in Ezekiel 28 verses 11 to 17, caused it. Otherwise, there seems to be no logical explanation as to why God would destroy his first creation. However, although these passages may be interpreted this way, this is by no means the only interpretation. For example, some understand Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 15 as looking forward to Satan's future fall, described in Revelation chapter 20. And certainly no time reference is given in either passage. So they are open to indiv individual 
interpretation. And then fourthly, there's many passages in scripture which refer to the creation, but none of these hint at there having been a ruin and subsequent restoration of this. For example, if you look at Exodus 20 verse 11, or Nehemiah 9 verse 6, Psalms 96 verse 5, 148 verse 5, and Isaiah 45 verse 18, John 1 verse 3, and Hebrews 11 verse 3. And then fifthly, present-day scientists believe that Neanderthal man coexisted with modern man. Many who believe the ruined six-day reconstruction theory, however, believe that all human-like beings were destroyed in the pre-Adamic cataclysm. There is therefore a large discrepancy between the accepted scientific dating of such bones and the beliefs of people who accept the ruined six-day reconstruction theory. The disadvantage of this is that that's one of the reasons for holding the ruined six-day reconstruction theory in the first place. It's in order to reconcile the Bible with present-day scientific thinking on the age of the earth and the dating of items in it. However, in trying to achieve this reconciliation, other discrepancies surface as a result, and the dating of the Neanderthal bones is one of them. And lastly, the appearance of light on day one but the sun, moon and stars appearing three days later on day four is also a major weakness, just as it was in the theory of progressive creation. In the next talk, we'll look at the last theory of creation in this series of talks. And this is the theory that creation was revealed to man over a period of six days by God. <laughs>